Hey everyone, and welcome back. In episode 107 of our Starbase Weekly Updates, we're going to get right into the action and cover all SpaceX has been up to since IFT3. Now let's dig in. The Friday after launch, we saw construction crews returning to work, placing more concrete for the new office building. The new vehicle testing stand is now taking shape at the SpaceX Massey outpost, and installation of the propellant and data lines is well underway. Once the new facilities are operational, the old test stand will likely be torn down and replaced with another orbital launch pad. Construction of the ninth segment of the new launch tower is coming along nicely, as workers spent the day putting in the support beams for the floor deck beneath the pulleys for the chopsticks. Outside the launch complex, methane tankers were refueling the propellant farms, reloading the storage tanks to prepare for the next round of vehicle testing. Inside Star Factory's new halls, the structural steel has been painted white, protecting the steel inside and making the factory a brighter workspace. Trim pieces are being installed above the glass, covering the gaps between the steel sheeting and the windows. With structural steelwork now complete, installation of the outer facade supports on the easternmost wall is well underway. On the opposite side of the building, the westernmost wall of the building is under construction as crews began raising columns bearing fixtures for the outer cladding and architectural shaping for the exterior wall. Once the columns were put in place, structural support beams were added for the architectural elements between the two columns, while construction cranes kept the columns stable for the work. Over at the launch site, the stitchers got back to work running their wicking lines into the ground to drain and settle the site for the second launch tower. Saturday morning, we saw concrete workers back at the build site, continuing their work on the office building's foundation. Workers completed the pour two hours later. On Sunday, the boom was raised on SpaceX's LR-11000, which was laid down ahead of the launch of Integrated Flight Test 3. The crane was then brought to the lifting position at Test Stand B, ready to pick up where they left off with Starship 29. Looking at the launch site on Monday, we can see that the exterior sheeting of the upper sections of the small water tank were torn off during the launch and will need to be replaced ahead of Flight 4. Scaffolding was raised on the orbital launch mount after the launch, and crews were quick to begin damage assessment and repairs at the complex, cutting into the steel in places where the structure was damaged. Another section of concrete in front of the propellant storage tanks was broken up and removed, clearing the way for the expansion of the tank farm's infrastructure. Back at the Star Factory, the first rooftop beam was put in place to bridge the western columns with the rest of the building. On Tuesday, workers began installing the diagonal support beams on Section 9 of Starbase's second orbital launch tower. Parts of the test stand tank farm were also under maintenance this week, with crews taking out and replacing some of the plumbing inside. The first section of Megabay 2's folding fabric door was brought to the bay's entrance to be unpacked as workers began to weatherproof the building's workspaces with the large prefabricated door panels. Other hardware at the test stand tank farm were lifted and shifted as workers continued to ready the stand for Ship 29's return. After spending several days stowed away at Sanchez, the Raptor installation platform was brought back to the launch complex, taking a leisurely journey to ensure that the top heavy tower would not tip over during the trip. Work continued on the second orbital launch tower's ninth and topmost section as work progresses towards the rooftop level of the tower. Work on the new flame trench for static fires at the Massey's outpost continues as cranes moved elements of the flame bucket at the site. Plumbing work continued at the test stand tank farm, with larger sections of pipe being moved around the site. Over at Boca Chica Village, the placement of a good-sized slab of reinforced concrete several inches thick began. Will this be for new tiny homes, a parking lot, warehouse, or possibly a new mobile home park? Knock yourself out in the comments below and let us know what you think. The booster alignment pins used to help guide the booster into proper position while it's lowered onto the launch mount were brought back to the launch complex to be reinstalled on the orbital launch mount. Preparations were well underway ahead of the pour for the new equipment foundations in front of the propellant farm storage tanks with rebar laid in the hole excavated the day before. Using a large template for the planned equipment, bolts were set in place and welded to the rebar. 
This may provide a pad for a number of vaporizers or other ground support equipment. Installation of the floor to ceiling glass resumed in the new facilities near the launch complex, showing confidence in the Glazer's work after the third integrated flight test. The Drawworks cable on the orbital launch integration tower was inspected and adjusted, verifying the integrity of the tower's lifting components. Large numbers of orbital tank farm plumbing assemblies continue to arrive at the launch complex as work continues to integrate the new horizontal storage tanks into the system. Portions of the cable tray were damaged during the launch and the damaged parts are being taken out for repair and replacement. The two-point ship lifter was brought back to the launch complex in the afternoon before setting down in anticipation of the next lift. With the speed characteristics of SpaceX's projects, concrete was placed for the new pad in front of the D2 gate, bearing the mounting fixtures for new tank farm hardware. Back at Sanchez, the first roof beams were installed in the next launch tower's ninth segment. Once the roof is complete, the bulk of the remaining work will be for the tower's active segments, including the ship quick disconnect arm and lifting elements, which are likely being shipped from Florida mostly complete. With the first elements of the western wall standing securely, crews began lifting the various roof beams into position at the Star Factory expansion, building out the final section of the road-facing side of the facility. By early Wednesday morning, metal work was underway inside the orbital launch mount, while workers inspected various components of the chopsticks. Continuing the daily ritual for the week, another round of concrete placement began at the site of the new office building. Inside Mega Bay 2, the first section of the door was installed as workers on extra tall lifts fastened the door's parts together. Shorter rooftop beams were installed sequentially on the roof of the next launch tower's ninth segment as workers hurried to finish the structural members for the tower. The steel shielding at the base of the orbital launch integration tower was being examined for damage with an ultrasonic tester. We can see that small pieces of steel over the drawworks housing were peeled away during the last launch. The drawworks carriage was also given an examination, verifying that the cabling and various systems on the tower arms were in working order. The vertical tanks recently installed in front of the horizontal propellant storage tanks began to be painted white. Making use of an excavator's concrete breaker, another section of concrete in front of the orbital tank farm was once again broken up and excavated. The booster quick disconnect housing has a difficult job protecting the quick disconnect hardware from the full fury of Super Heavy's 33 Raptor engines during the tower avoidance maneuver. Unfortunately, the quick disconnect hardware did not survive unscathed. The back cover of the housing was removed, revealing damage to the propellant lines inside, which workers had already began to cut and disconnect. Outside the propellant farm, form work was placed for further extension of the protective blast wall behind the new horizontal tanks. The booster quick disconnect hood back shell was parked next to the orbital tank farm berm after its removal, keeping it out of the way at the complex. Inside the Sanchez site, workers began to dismantle the engine installation stand, pulling the top ring off the structure as they began to repurpose the site. Back at the launch site, workers began to remove the flexible cryogenic propellant lines from the booster quick disconnect system, starting with the methane line. The liquid oxygen line was removed as well, as both lines need to be replaced after apparently suffering damage during the launch. Over at the rocket garden, workers began fitting scaffolding support brackets to the side of Booster 4's methane tank near the common dome as work continued to scrap the old booster. On Thursday, sections of potential new booster quick disconnect hoses were seen on the back of a truck heading for the launch complex. Booster 4's methane tank scaffolding was finished overnight, giving workers a platform for cutting through the tank. We can also see concrete placement underway by the orbital tank farm within the berm wall forms. At the second orbital launch tower's prefab area, workers have been installing steel framing on the top of the 8th section's top level. This steel is likely to support walls separating the level's walkways from the central opening that will house the elevator. This framing could also be used as supports for any equipment that would be installed this high on the tower. The main structure of the new booster stand under assembly is nearing completion, with just a handful of segments left to complete the full ring. 
Workers also removed the counterweights from the crane that was setting the pilings for the parking garage, which has been removed from the construction site. Back at the build site, the second section of Mega Bay 2's door was raised into place. Once it reached the level of the hanging door length, the new section of the door was attached to the first. The first pieces of steel for the office building were also erected, rapidly filling the site with the vertical columns. The first beams were quickly added, joining the columns together. With the first section of the building's second floor and truss braced, walls began to take shape. Inside the high bay, Ship 29 was lifted off the turntable and placed onto a waiting transport stand. At the western end of the Star Factory expansion, the wall at the edge of the complex continues to grow toward the road one column at a time. The fifth column of the western wall was in place by early afternoon as construction enters the home stretch for the current roadside phase of the Star Factory construction. While construction continued throughout the build site, crews on lifts began to disconnect Ship 29 from the high bay crane's two-point lifter, making sure to keep the heavy assembly away from the heat shield. With the two-point lifter out of the way, the ship was ready to depart for the launch complex. Ship 29 was then moved to the high bay doorway as crews prepared to take the ship back to the launch complex. Booster 4 departed the rocket garden in the evening, stopping outside the entrance to Highway 4. The booster then made its way down the highway and into the build site in the evening, pulling into the front gate before rolling over to Mega Bay 1. Booster 4 then made its way into the bay, where workers will dismantle the booster's tanks for scrap. An hour before midnight, Starship 29 departed the high bay, rolling out towards the highway to begin its journey to the launch complex for engine testing. This week at Cape Canaveral, Friday saw Booster 1077 lowered onto a transporter for return to Roberts Road. Support ship Megan returned to port with Crew Dragon Endurance, following splashdown and the conclusion of the Crew 7 expedition to the International Space Station. Launching on Booster 1062's 19th flight, Starlink Group 6-44 lifted off into the night sky, carrying 23 more Starlink V2 minis to orbit. Doug returned to Port Canaveral on Monday, carrying both fairing halves from the Starlink G644 mission and towing home a shortfall of Gravitas with Booster 1062 on deck. Bob then headed out to sea on Tuesday, towing just read the instructions out for the Starlink Group 6-42 launch. Booster 1062 was offloaded from a shortfall of Gravitas on Wednesday for stowage at the docks. The booster was then laid down on the horizontal transporter on Thursday, ahead of its return to the famous Roberts Road. With Space Launch Complex 40 now certified to launch the Dragon spacecraft, Commercial Resupply Service Mission SPX-30 became the first Dragon to lift off from the pad in four years, carrying Cargo Dragon C-209 on its fourth mission to the International Space Station. After lofting the Cargo Dragon into space, Booster 1080 returned to landing Zone 1, completing its sixth launch to date. And there you have it, another SpaceX and Starbase weekly update brought to you by Lab Padre. Don't forget to hit the like and subscribe button if you haven't already, and we'll see you next week. Thanks for watching. Lab Padre out.